everyone in the audience, this is a room about if you knew all that you knew about the tongue and osteopathic view. Michelle is here giving us her valuable time to answer questions and give you support and love and guidance. Uh, stand in her power and we'll, we'll go from there. Michelle, how does that sound? <laughs> That sounds and... amazing because I certainly didn't want, I didn't prepare anything. I'm really good with q and I really um, I'm fueled by people's curiosity and just meeting them where they're at. I mean, I've been a family practice doctor now. I my, got my degree in 2000. Um, and then I guess it was 2005 that I started seeing patients and working with the dentist, Derek Nordstrom, who developed the osteopathic approach to orthodontics, which doesn't use force. It use set, uses setting up the, the force vectors in the body to allow the tongue to create enough space for all the functions of the face. Like, yes, the teeth become, there becomes enough um, room for the teeth to not only look well, look right cosmetically, but also function well in terms of um, jaw function and creating enough space for good breathing and even al and allowing for the balance of the inner ear and the vision system. And so I really went on instinct that this was something that I really needed to know. And I would say at least 50% of patients with anything have a big unidentified component related to this that's standing in the way of them and, and full wellness. It's huge. I am a medical doctor, seven years of medical school, and I went to an osteopathic medical school, which is maybe 11% of the schools, or is it 11% of the medical doctors in the nation come from this osteopathic route. And then of the, osteop uh, the physicians trained in osteopathic schools, really only a tiny percentage end up truly embracing the roots of the, the philosophy of osteopathic medicine which dates back to the mid 1800s so what is it it's it's basically looking at the body as a as a complex interplay of mechanics and energetics and circulation it's basically biomimicry medicine how does the body actually work and if we are able to assist it in restoring to full function in all of those areas that it has the ability to basically self-correct. But I was taught in medical school that the um, physiologic range of respiration rate, the rate at which we breathe, um, is 14 to 18 breaths per minute, which is more than double what the optimal <laughs> range really is, which is really, we'd like it under 10. If we're, if we're truly optimized, which means we're actually coupled with the pulse of the earth, we're breathing at around 5.5 cycles per minute. And this is just, it's just a different state than we live in in Western culture. Um, the potential for wellness that uh, it's really a nervous system thing, like the tongue palate relationship and the refinement of that whole function and what becomes possible in terms of retraining the physiology. It, it's basically yoga. It's, it's resetting the body to be able to rest in that deeply embodied earth and trained um, integrated state between the physical body and subtle body. And, and it can become quite a spiritual idea in that um, one of the things that I've learned from correlating in the teaching with the teachings of Vedic philosophy, for instance, is that the roof of the mouth is actually considered a location of a chakra. And it provides a gateway of communication between the heart and the higher centers. Um, so right tongue function conceivably could open the door to more intuitive abilities and connection with our higher selves and higher knowing. So there's actually a parking place for the tongue on the roof of the mouth. There's that rough area in the front, maybe a centimeter from the teeth. And in people with physiologic, I meaning normal or normal, well, normal, uh, it's rare to find this actually. So it's not exactly normal, but it's the healthy default is this natural cave toward the front of the mouth where the tongue naturally seats itself and is meant to rest all the time unless you're speaking or eating. 
swallow, smile, and sleep are more related than you think. So um, what happens is that because we don't breastfeed as much, right? And bottle feeding doesn't provide the same amount of suction and work that happens against the palate to create this nice spacious roof of the mouth. Um, There's so many other reasons why the face would be crowded. Um, Dietary, nutritional, um, not chewing because our food is now soft. So we don't have that vertical force in that we call it vertical, yeah, vertical power. And that's the combination of swallowing and chewing that actually grows the face forward and down and creates enough space for everything. So here's the take home message on this. If your tongue were not derailed in some way from its natural work, you would not need orthodontics. The face would develop enough space for the teeth to come in properly and there also to be enough room for air to move in the back of the throat. Because we, when we don't grow the face, forward and down by this right tongue action, we actually don't grow, uh, airway doesn't become as large. This is, a, this is huge. Acad- <laughs> academically speaking, and ideally that the tongue would not touch, the, the tip of the tongue would not touch the teeth, but very few people have room for that. I would say the contact to the center of the palate there's an actual meeting place of four bones there and the sphenoid, which is the main cranial structure that kind of is the, it's the junction that determines tight, not tight, or breath, not breath, or energy or not energy running in the whole body is that center of the skull. So this tongue contact on the palate kind of with every swallow, it's about a pound of pressure running vertically if the tongue is doing its right job, there's this little nudge on the sphenoid that keeps that sphenobasilar symphysis to get really technical, <laughs> that has the whole skeleton kind of be able to pulse rhythmically um, and, and, and behave more like a behavior than, than an object. Like the, the whole skeleton needs to breathe. The whole body is never static in its um, way of being for a better way of putting it, um, there's nothing solid about us. And to the extent that we can live connected to our fluid essence moment to moment, then like the thing I keyed in on that you said was this tension that you hold in your sleep, even though your mouth is closed and and you're thinking your tongue is kind of in the right place. Mm -hmm. Um, So there's some way that your body registered vigilance or defense and either it's patterned into the nervous system or there's kind of a habituation that your whole skeleton made to reflect the nervous system state that has to be retrained in the reverse direction. And the first thing that I thought of and that came into mind when you're speaking is buteco breathing as a way to kind of retrain the nervous system back on. And then whatever the nervous system is doing, the life force circulation is doing. And then whatever the life force circulation is doing, then the structure is, it's form follows function. The structure begins to reflect that freedom and flow in the subtle body. That's the order of things. That's a little bit of the osteopathic secret sauce that um, is also, you know, um, it's it's understood in the Eastern approaches to medicine, but that's the most non-Western part. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's fantastic. I think there's a lot there for me to learn. Say that we we are shifting from being a chronic mouth breather to a nose breather, and we have these symptoms of potential crowding of the teeth, or we have you know the airway has been obstructed. What in adult, in our adult form, because I know a lot of this um, sort of the jawline sort of forms as we grow up, but, <clears throat> but as we're an adult now, what are some of the remedies that we can move through? Like, for example, you know, you talked about shifting your, your breathing habits, and I know, you know, the osteo, the osteo block is an example of something else. I was wondering, yeah, what are some of the things that we could be looking out for to shift this? Um, there's so much to say about it and I 
want to tell everyone that I wrote an article that summarizes basically a do-it-yourself approach and then indications for referral as well that comes from that piece that Jordan grabbed that picture from. So if what we're saying doesn't land or you don't capture it, uh, one thing that could be cool is if people go and reference that article and then harvest their questions there, and then we can circle back and do part B of this. Okay. So I want to make a point here to everyone that the that we can all at any age go between these two uh, formations. And this is where we get into the quantum thing, because the, the word on the street is that, you know, to really reform a face, you have to be a young person that's still growing. However, when you get into this opening up of the life force circula circulation and literally shifting the density and fluidity of structures, and we know this is possible because we see these ancient yogis and, you know, Tai Chi masters doing this really fluid movement as though they're not solid well into their late later years. Now, most of us don't move this much chi, but if you want to be a person who basically remodels their anatomy later in life, uh, the possibility exists if you are able to open up the meridians and get that chi flowing and literally remodel the bones. So what do I do as an osteopath? Um, and as Dr. Riders, Dr. Daniel Riders was saying that the form of osteopathy that I practice and Dr. Carmine Van Deven practices that Daniel just interviewed is kind of this uh, more energetic, more esoteric, not mechanical, definitely almost a shamanic practice where you touch in and have a relationship with and go on a journey with the subtle body such that you don't. I don't actually do anything. I hold space for the body to express in this way and um, almost refresh to some original capacity, the design of which may be lost under several layers of dissociation. So, so we go to connect the person as you would with meditative practices or yogic practices that are able to really help the individual get back in touch with their spiritual self or their subtle body, physical body integration. So when you can render yourself um, moldable, that's kind of the esoteric piece, then you start to work with the tongue with, um, you know, exercises. Like I try to make it fun and enjoyable and not too tedious. I, I have people, in, and this is really Carly's domain. But in terms of, you know, we can change it. We can make a shift here, even in adulthood. And yeah, do it yourself not just do it yourself, but so like the tongue practices, for example, and the changing of the airways, but also devices. And I would add, you know, that, that malleability that you're talking about, would that connect to teeth crowding as well? Do you think that is uh, reversible in this sort of way that you're talking about? Absolutely. Absolutely. I have it. This happen all the time. My um, old child, that her, her orthodontist said, oh, she'll be needing braces for sure. And I was like, yeah, I, I don't think so. <laughs> but we just went about, you know, and Carly knows this because she treated my child and my daughter is not the most disciplined kid. And I didn't even treat her that much. And she didn't do most of her homework. And still somehow the body just receiving a little nudge in the right direction seemed to draw on its memory for right function. It's really remarkable what the body's capable of. I want to remind you guys all of that. Yeah like that, that innate regeneration and getting back to a state of homeostasis that if you just allow get out of your own way the body's going to get back there if you remove the barriers but uh it's yeah it's so empowering listening to what you say because it makes sense to me it just makes innate sense uh gina welcome to the stage feel free to drop any questions if you have any I'll make this really short because I, I'm excited to hear what Carly would have to say as well, but I'm curious about how the work of Weston Price overlaps with this osteopathic view. Um, I'm sure, Michelle, you must know who, his, who he is and his work and as a dentist and early anthropologist. That's how I've stumbled across his work. Uh I wrote a lot about this in the piece that I, the one piece that I wrote only because I didn't find a better, more succinct source anywhere um, that's on my website. So it's all about that. In fact, if I, 
I found a video on YouTube that I, it's a lay produced, not particularly scientific or medical, although it does include some, it's called attractive or not. And it kind of goes through the whole arc of back maybe 150 years and includes how Weston Price, you know, this dentist who traveled the globe and looked at all of these uh, uh, tribal communities whose facial proportions and development were really superior to Westerners. And, <clears throat> and so from that, he derived that there were these practices called uh, the traditions, the nourishing traditions of these, the, these different communities. And that was the culmination of, of this book, uh, well, his book, and then many that have come since. And a lot of it has to do, as I, I think I referenced before you got on, with the nutrient levels, but also the ways that we eat uh, don't have to work as hard to break down processed food, like we don't have to chew that much. Um, uh, and, and simply how over time, and James Nestor, the journalist, went into this in depth in his brilliant book, Breath, that we talked about when the room opened, that the skulls of humans have simply deteriorated in their integrity in terms of o over the last multiple decades, and it's continuing to go in a not so great direction. And so uh, Western Price wouldn't be happy <laughs> with what he's seeing now. We certainly haven't turned, turned the trajectory around. I was told that in order to make your tongue stronger, you should take the tip of your tongue to the roof of your mouth and then slide it back so that it's curling back and, so to speak, the bottom of the tongue is on the roof of your mouth. And I'm wondering what you thought about that. <laughs> um, that's a great exercise to, to, to kind of stretch out your lingual frenum in one of its uh, positions, but... Um, and it, it's a, it's a, it, it's a, it's an okay exercise. I think there's many better ways, but it's a, it's an exercise. I, I wouldn't say that's the one. Um, I'll tell you one of my favorites. Uh, I mean, there's, everything's case dependent because people need different things. Some people go uh, very, you know, a lot of people go asymmetrical only across their mouth. They have, you know, their teeth will be off. Um, usually if the tongue moves in a little bit off center so that your teeth don't really match up. So um, I have a dental background. So we kind of look at the whole thing and then we, they you know, then the jaw gets a part of it and then it can move to the neck. So it just kind of keeps flowing through the body. But um, the teeth and the, the tongue is kind of where I hold my focus in the jaw, those three places. But, um, but yeah, um, that's an exercise. Uh, I call that slippery slide back. I, I, that's just an old exercise I've been doing for years. I use it a lot uh, after a phrenectomy, a, a release of the frenum. Sometimes that's real tethered and we, we either laser or surgically release it. But it's one of the stretching exercises for the frenum is what I use it for. And it also back to ask, it reaches the styloglossus muscle, which is the muscle that lifts the tongue up and pulls it back up into the mouth where it should be. And that one's really weak on everybody. So it, it kind of accesses that one a bit. So it's a good exercise actually, the more I think about it. So when you say take the tongue on the roof of your mouth, are you taking the top of your tongue, the entire top of your tongue on the roof of your mouth then? You mean as uh, what we want ideally in an ideal world? Yes. It's yes. We want most of the tongue to live on the roof of the mouth. On an adult, sometimes we get you know, as much as we can. I shoot for the whole thing. I try to get the whole tongue up on everybody because if it's not all the way up, you know, then a little bit's down and that can, you know, interfere with something or another. Um, if it, on a kid, you, it's easy because they, they develop right in front of you. You know, you can just watch them grow their own palates. The tongue is very forceful. Um, it works with a lot of other cranial muscle or uh, facial muscles and the power is unbelievable. It's designed to create the face. That's what it does. And it gets thrown off so many ways and it doesn't go up to the palate and the faces don't get developed. This is the whole premise of malocclusion and crooked teeth and jaw, reverted, retreated jaws. So when we get the facial function normalized on a child, they can grow their own faces at least to their genetic potential and um, widen the, say, and those kids, yes, whole tongue. Adults, um, you know, some people come to me with some pretty um, 
you know, some hard anatomy to deal with. You know, they they just depending on where how vaulted their palate is or um, how you know tethered their tongue is. So we always do the best we can. But most of the time, I, I make it you know, work. It's just if you want to work hard enough, we can get it up there. And, Thank you know, you. With the, the, uh, yeah. one more note. If you have a great osteopath, so this is where a great osteopath comes in because they, the powerful, like somebody like Michelle is so magical. And I can work a face and I can get the nervous system going. So I get the cranial nerves integrated to the nerves, to the brainstem. And that creates uh, maximum oxygen to the brain. So now the person starts to start the flow that Michelle talks about all the time. And then you put her, put somebody in the hands like hers and it's, they just kind of melt. We can just kind of change those faces. Now, this is not something that happens all the time. Believe me, I've never seen really any other osteopath be able to do it, but her, honestly. Um, but we do it in our little small group. Um, and it's not something you can go out and find. And, you know, if you ask your orthodontist about this stuff, they would probably send you out the door and think you were crazy. But this is stuff that we, if you work with the body the way we do, you can get results, really nice results. Thank you. Sure. Um, I want to say that I actually I'm not the only one <laughs> and the discipline that covers this melting uh, re remodeling organic remodeling of the structure is a small segment of osteopathy that Dr. Reiters alluded to that Dr. Devin um, Carmine Van Devin is a part of it's it's biodynamic osteopathy. So maybe it's 5% of osteopaths who work at this energetic level and it's an interface of you know, imparting force and then stepping back and letting the body breathe there. It's not all fluid. Like I do quite a bit of, sometimes I'll melt a face and then I'll just get an impulse from the body to grab something and pull it. And sometimes I find myself like jaws of life, like opening up the bones of the face and it sounds kind of radical, but when it's guided by the body, my nervous system is so, so anchored and so still and so in response to something that I trust completely. So it's, it is in order to do this, even the force, the structural parts, being able to tune into my own um, and trained and grounded and intuitive state is is an essential piece. Michelle, that's exactly what it sounds like to me. Right? As Carly is giving you all this amazing love, it sounds like you are tuning into your higher purpose, your higher passion, the things that sort of get you switched on. The reason that you're in this work, I, I'm assuming here, is because you love to do it. And when you're in that sort of loving, joyous state, it's helping you connect to those intuitive uh, choices that you're making, it sounds like. It makes total sense to me. Absolutely. All driven by the heart, honestly. That's a whole nother layer of the conversation. Um, I wanted to say two things that came up. One is that these um, different, um, this is to speak to your question, Gina, that the um, tribal peoples of the planet that have clicking in their languages and lots of forceful sound, sounds that they make with their languages have phenomenal facial development. A lot of movement and diversity with tongue functions and forces happening. So one of the exercises I give people is, is some to practice being one of those people. Like I play this game with my daughter where we, we try to, we speak in tongues and we do this, uh, well, not exactly in tongues, but we, we, pretend we speak one of these languages or we'll do percussion in the car to, to songs with the tongue on the palate um, with suctioning. And I describe that in the, in the little piece that I wrote on my website. That's because I find that the things that people really enjoy that involve some element of play and also collaboration with others are the things that will more naturally gravitate toward and are likely to succeed even for the element of enjoyment that elevates the body in response to anything that we do. May, sorry, this is Heather speaking again. Um, do, do we have time for one more quick question? Harrison, Go are you cool? Heather. Okay, no just <laughs> while well, I've got Michelle and Carly here. Um, so a few years back, I kept catching my teenage son making this incredibly hilarious face when he was kind of like chilling on his own and I asked him what he was doing and he called it, if I remember correctly, he called it 
mewing or mooing, mewing or something. And he said it was to, it was something with the way that he pressed his tongue to the roof of his mouth to help strengthen and shape his jaw. Is that, is that correct? Was that like, is that um, an exercise that can be done at, to help like strengthen or set a jaw? Um, Dr. Mew is a very, very famous um, dentist in England who started a lot of this uh, thought process many, many years ago. And he's been uh, one of my mentors for a long time. So he's obviously got some movements they call mewing. I'm thinking that's what you're talking about. So, um, you know, I, I've just studied a lot of his work and he's taught me on, on some classes years ago. But so I don't know exactly what exactly your son was doing, but I'm thinking that's where it came from. That'd be my first name. I think it's, um, what's his first name? I'll Google it real fast while we're here. Michael but, Mew uh, is the younger of the. Yes. The, the, yeah. Oh. So, yeah. So he must have stumbled across him because he said he watched some videos and did some reading. And um, he's, yeah, he's been doing it for probably close to three years now. Um, I don't notice him doing it as much. Um, you know, he's 16 now, but definitely he. He did it quite often, and, and he said he tries to do it a few times a day, um, like like an exercise program for himself. So I just um, I had never heard of it before, and um, this this group just kind of reminded me of of what he had sort of you know explained to me. So it's good to know that you know perhaps he had stumbled across something that's been helpful for him. So thank you again for for this room. Michelle, if you had anything to add with that, feel free to jump in. I just think it's funny. That's how we started this room, Jordan. Uh -huh. we, were talk we were talking about mewing, and that's how the idea began. Uh, go for it, Michelle. Yeah, sure. Are we trying to end soon, or do we launch into some uh, – I have a little bit more time. I don't know what your plan was for the closing. I unfortunately have to run to a meeting, so I think we'll close it off in a couple of minutes, if that's okay with okay. you. But we'll so definitely I be love... doing this again. Yeah, I'm really grateful for the uh, John and Mike Mew, senior and junior, because uh, there's such such accessibility and there are such a diversity of videos on YouTube, including younger folks like mewing influencers who do these successive check-ins on their own progress, and they just make it really cool. So I found a few, um, captured a few links of some of the ones that I love, but if you watch one thing, there's a video on YouTube called Attractive Face, uh, Attractive or Not. And it's about, it goes into all the Weston Price stuff. And it goes into the timelines and change uh, trajectories of some of these YouTube influencers. It's maybe 12 minutes long. It's super entertaining. It really captures the attention and imagination of kids and adults alike. I just love really high yield things that get the point across really quickly so that people get on board and we don't lose them. And Michelle, maybe you could uh, explain very quickly what the parameters are for mewing. So I know that uh, a part of it is the tongue on top of the mouth as we've been talking about so far in this, this chat, but there's also a part of the teeth to do with it as well. Like it, in my understanding, it's, bringing the front teeth to be meeting together and the back teeth, a big part of it. Do you, does that make sense? That's for sure. Carly, Carly would be the better answer of that. So, um, uh, really here's your resting face. Okay. This is really the one thing to take from the meeting and it takes strength to get here, but uh, you want your, you can start with the first half inch of your tongue should lift and and kind of settle in gently about a fourth of an inch behind your front teeth it should not touch any of your front teeth your tongue should really never touch any teeth because it will move your teeth and that means you're going the wrong direction you want to go vertically up your teeth should be parted about two to three millimeters that's the thickness of a coin so that's our freeway space in the dental world and that's a, a gentle and that has these are all reflexed and then the lips just gently sealed. And that's, that will force you to nasal breathe eventually. And you eventually put more and more of your tongue up. So that kind of is going to sum up, you know, a lot of mewing right there.
Wow. Well, maybe it's about the percentage of dependence on soft cooked foods because, yeah. Um, yeah, to the extent that we've gone in that direction, we've definitely been undergrowing our faces radically for many decades. And then the dietary thing is is fairly large, and I referenced some papers in the piece that those two images are from that Jordan and Harrison have up on their icons um, from the art from an article that's right on my website front page the link to which is in my Instagram bio, which is in my clubhouse bio. If you touch my picture, you can scroll down and find that. And I think just to jump in there too, and then we'll move down to Heather with her question. Um, it's also the chewing, just from this osteopathic sort of facial and teeth perspective, so important as we've just been talking about. But from my digestive perspective as well, getting down into the gut, the more that we chew, the more that we, we activate, a lot of us think that, that our digestion begins when the food hits the gut, but the digestion begins in the mouth when we're activating the, not only the enzymes in the mouth for the, to break down the food, but the enzymes, the chewing motion then corresponds to the gut to be ready for the food, right? Mm -hmm. So the more that we chew, the more that we digest and assimilate and take on nutrients and that, that, that whole cycle enhances. So for anyone listening, this is... A, so important and I'm just so grateful that Michelle and Carly are here today to really promote this conversation because I just I love it uh, with that I do want to keep the ball rolling we are going to go for another 20 15 20 minutes in this room before I have to run to another meeting uh, Heather thank you for coming up on stage we'd love to give you the space with any questions you had for Michelle or Carly Thank you, Harrison. What a fantastic room to be listening in on. Um, just a little bit of a background. When I was when I was younger, um, I, my mom had me at an orthodontist at a young age due to recommendations from the, a doctor. Um, I was a very heavy mouth breather. Um, the orthodontist wanted to. I remember hearing him kind of pull my mom to the side um, and discuss with her about wanting to break and reset my jaw, which thankfully my mother said, absolutely not. That's absurd. You're not breaking my child's jaw. So I did, um, I ended up getting actually surgery to remove, remove my tonsils and my adenoids, which I was told at the time I had, you know, as an eight or nine year old um, tonsils larger than most full grown adult men um, to the point where they brought medical staff in and medical students to look down my throat before my tonsils were removed but I do remember waking up in the hospital actually feeling what it felt like to breathe through my nose for the first time to really truly be able to take a breath and then I spent about three and a half years with braces headgear um, and so my question for you is as an adult um I'm in my late 40s now. As an adult, I still find myself at night feeling like my tongue just is uncomfortable and is not resting, you know, properly in my mouth. It's almost like sometimes I feel like it's strained and I don't know where to consciously or unconsciously place it, I guess. Is that is that a common thing for for mouth breathers from such a young age? Like that. So that's my question for you. And is there anything I could do to maybe relax or help it? This is Heather and I'm done speaking. Thank you. Go for it, Carly. Okay. So just because tonsils and adenoids are removed does not mean you instantly start to nasal breathe and swallow correctly, unfortunately. I never see it happen. I'm sure it happens once in a while. You, I, It'd be really wonderful if our ENTs would get on board with us a little bit more and... Um, uh, you know, and make and still ensure that that goes a child or an adult goes right to some breathing consulting. You know, we just haven't. We we're all seem to be slipping, and there's so many people who don't know how to breathe. When I say don't know how to breathe, swallow is such a big part of it. Um, and you know, the breathing is so complex too because we're all a little bit too much in sympathetic nervous system. So when you mouth breathe to sum it up uh, quickly, your, your airways, all your tubes dil uh, dilate, um, constrict, I'm so sorry, constrict. So you, you get, you can get, if your tongue's blocking, if your tongue did never taught, was never taught to go up, that's a reflex behavior that has to be instilled to, to your brainstem. 
And, you know, you started off with big tonsils, so you probably had a good habit of mouth breathing. And then you just never, never developed this little sequence that I described a minute ago where your tongue has to lift up 2,000 times a day. It has to be an automatic behavior, just like you blinked a minute ago. So that really, it, unless somebody kind of stumbles, stumbles upon somebody like me, it really never get, gets completely organized, especially the back part of the tongue, which is the heaviest part to get up there. And that's the part that usually affects our sleep apnea breathing patients. When you lay down, it just drops back into the airway and occludes the airway. And that's the, that's the OSA, obstructive sleep apnea, is the tongue and the surrounding muscle, muscles that support the tongue all collapse into the airway because we're not using that part of our body. We've disconnected from it. It's, it we don't know it's there, really. It's kind of foreign. Um, so it's just lazy and collapses. Um, Sorry, that's my puppy behind me squeaking a toy. I'm going to take it away from her. I don't know if you hear her. But anyway, um, so, so as an adult, um, the tongue grows bigger when you don't use it properly. That's number one. It, it, it grows laterally to the sides, gets wider. Uh, it does all sorts of compensations. It's, and probably what might have happened to you is your tongue might have just grown a little bit longer and bigger. But the good thing is tongues are reshapeable. I do it every day, all day long. They're just, um, I kind of use the uh, uh, analogy, it's like a jellyfish. If you give it a container, it will take on the shape of a container. So we give the container the, the palate and we start moving it and it gets a lot more exercise. It goes from laying low and moving forward or laterally, which is not much movement, to lifting up the whole tongue, usually is very heavy, and then rolling and dancing across the roof of the mouth all day long. And then when, if we lift it down to talk or eat, where it's going to fly right back up like a magnet when we're done. So that takes a ton of inherent strength. And in doing, creating that natural movement, uh, tones your tongue. And I don't know, they just reshape. It just happens. I, you know, I've not once not been able to get a tongue up in a palate. So it probably just needs, you need a little work, I would think, um, would be my, my, my. Michelle, did you have anything you wanted to add? If not, we'll move on to Linda. I want to make sure people know how to reach Carly because uh, I send her information around quite a bit. And I had her on, I have a study group where we kind of do some academic investigations and socializing on, on Facebook. And I've had her on a few times but because I'm thinking, you know, versus one-on-one, -on -one, wouldn't it be great if we could let, sort of learn collectively these common issues? And patterns are so individual. And for anyone with any complexity, I think a, a thorough, you know, formal oral facial myologic ex, uh, evaluation is really a, a wonderful thing to have access to. So, perfect. Thank you, Carly. Thank sure. you for summarizing that. And uh, I think it's a good uh, circle and end to this chat today, today, guys. Thank you for being here, Carly and Michelle. And all the people have come up and asked questions, Heather, Linda, Ingrid, Gina, and all the people down the audience, thank you for listening. Uh, we, will, we will be doing this again. So Michelle and Carly, please uh, shoot me a message and we'll organize a time because I think, I mean, just from me being here, I've learned a lot and I'm sure that everyone else has also. So I want to keep the discussion going. If you guys want to be notified about when we do this again, the best way to do that is follow the moderators and also follow the club itself so you can be notified and also check out Instagram and notifications on there. Uh, I'm going to throw it back to you, Michelle and Carly, if they wanted to end with anything. If not, uh, we'll close the room down.